confidence video we have today, video charge, and those of you... So, um, thanks for having me. I'm going to just take a few minutes, I promise, to talk about the effects of shape, colloidal shape, on interactions, elastically medium interactions in the medical crystals or you know, general anisotropic fluids. So this is work that was carried out at Boulder uh, in Ivan Smolyev's lab. I'm a postdoc there. And this was with the collaboration with Tom Mason at UCLA. So can you flip this one? Thanks. So this is just a brief outline. So I'll just motivate this work by talking about anisotropy and colloidal interactions, why we're interested in it, how you generate it. Um, and then I'll give some background on spherical particles in the matter. Um, now, and so in this work, what we're doing is basically changing the shape of, of colloids and asking, you know, what's the effect of shape on these, on the anisotropy of the interactions? And so what we'll see, I hope I can convince you by the end of this talk, that at, in, at some level you can, you, can, you can actually control the interactions by controlling particle shape. And so I'll introduce a couple of techniques um, along the way. And conclude, so. So, okay. so in common isotropic liquids like water, um, the colloidal interactions you typically see are isotropic, the, the pair potentials are spherically symmetric. Uh, people generate anisotropy in, in the interaction in various ways, that is by uh, applying fields, for example, in electrorheological or magnetorheological fluids or maybe chemical patterning of spherical particles that are called Janus particles. Uh, and there are many other examples. Um, another thing you can do, alternatively, is you can just put your spherical particles into in an isotropic solvent, like a pneumatic liquid crystal. And you get highly anisotropic colloidal interactions that are mediated by the elasticity of the fluid. And so, you know, this, this was sort of pioneered by Philippe Goulon and Dave Waits uh, on the experimental side, and then Holger Stark and Tom Lubensky on the theoretical side. Um, and one of the essential features is that the symmetry of the interactions, the type, you know, the, 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 the types of interactions you get depends on the symmetry of the deformations of the director field surrounding isolated particles. So, for example, if you have this dipolar configuration, which looks like this, you get dipole-dipole interactions that tend to form chains of particles along the pneumatic core field director. Um, and if you have the Saturn ring configuration, which is a quadrupolar field, okay, you get quadrupolar interactions. So this is taken from uh, Musevich's group's paper in science, and this is a really nice piece of work. Um, and so for spheres, whether or not you get a dipole or a quadrupole depends on many things. It can depend on the size of the particle, the type of anchoring you have on the surface, uh, confinement, how big the sample is, and maybe external fields. And so what I'm going to talk about is what about particle shape? So to answer this question, uh, we fabricate particles lithographically. Okay, And so don't worry about the process. Just here's some pictures of them. These are SEM images. And so they're, they're platelet particles, and we basically can control the shape, the outer edge of the particle with lithography. And so what we're going to concentrate on are triangles, um, squares, these square donut things, and pentagons. Okay. And so we make the particles, we put them in uh, 5CB, which is a thermotropic room temperature pneumatic. Okay. And so for the triangles and pentagons, this is interesting, we see this parity effect where if you have an odd number of sides, you get a dipole, okay? And the interesting thing about these dipoles is that the dipole moment is perpendicular to the far field director, which hasn't been seen before. Um, now these square donuts, you get quadrupoles, okay? And let me mention that the surface anchoring is cleaner and degenerate. And in the case of these dipoles, What's inter well, another interesting fact is that there's no bulk defects here, as in the case with spheres with homeotropic anchoring. So you can imagine scaling this down to very small size scales and still getting dipoles. Okay. And so there's a nice sort of elegant analogy between the elasticity of pneumatics and electrostatics that was you know, recognized by Burchard and Dejeune quite a while ago, and sort of revisited by Stark and Levinsky. Uh, to understand the spherical colloid system. 
And so the idea is basically, in the one elastic constant, one elastic constant approximation, so my equations are gone, um, you know, the, the, the two components of the director field transverse to the far field director obey Laplace's equation. So you can expand these things in multipoles far away from the particle. And in this paper by Lev in 2002, they, they sort of recognize this nice geometric view of things where, you know, for a quadrupole you have these two planes of mirror symmetry, whereas in the dipolar case you break, you break a plane of mirror symmetry perpendicular to the far field director. So. And so you can understand why, you know, polygons with odd n, for example, like a triangle, give you dipoles, um, just from this simple picture. And one thing you can't see here is there's a Coulomb term, okay? And so the, the Coulomb term is, is only non-zero with a non-zero external torque applied to the pneumatic, and that's important. So um, now you can only imagine two, two orientations for a triangle in a uniform pneumatic, okay? And they both give dipolar director fields. This one, okay, where one side is along the director and one where the a side is perpendicular to the director. So this gives you a dipole along the far field director, this gives you a dipole perpendicular. All the others, okay, break these two planes of mirror symmetry, and so they give you a, a monopole term in the field, and so there would be a torque, they're unstable, so you don't you don't see some weird, you know, intermediate um, orientation. And that's why these are dipolar. Um, and so, okay, so, you know, we, we sort of, in, in Yvonne's lab, we, we study the orientational order, okay, of, say, pneumatics or cholesterics um, or other um, liquid crystals by doping, doping it with a sort of an isotropic fluorescent dye, okay? And then we use a laser scanning confocal microscope to map out the director field. And in lieu of time, I'm just going to move on. And so, in this... In this case here, okay, now you would see the same texture if you had homeotropic anchoring, okay, and you didn't really have any bulk defects. So we use this technique to sort of unambiguously demonstrate that the field is most definitely quadrupolar and that you have planar anchoring. So basically, this, this arrow here is showing the polarization, the excitation light. You get, you get bright fluorescence from regions where this the polarization of the excitation light is along the director, the local director. So you see two bright lobes when the polarizer is oriented like this, and you know, the flips when you orient it like this, and then you see a symmetric lobe pattern when you go perpendicular to the far field director. Uh, okay, and so we use optical tweezing to uh, manipulate particles and fluids, and video microscopy to probe their interactions. And so I'm not going to talk about this in a little time, or this, or this. And basically, um, so we can take these particles and grab them with optical traps, okay, and then release them and, and watch them interact, okay, and so, and then track their motion, um, you know, by recording video and analyzing the video. And so, you know, triangles, okay, they form these dipoles and they interact very much like dipoles. So, we have two triangles where their interparticle separation vector is parallel to the far field director, which is shown by this black arrow, and their dipoles are oriented anti-parallel, they attract, okay, just like the dipoles would. If you flip one around, they repel. And then if you have them oriented such that they're perpendicular to the far field director, uh, they repel when they're anti-parallel and attract when they're parallel. So that's fun. Interesting. In the case of squares, what we did is we sort of did this, you know, uh, blinking optical tweezer experiment where we, you know, hold the particles at some fixed separation and some angle relative to the far field director and release them over and over again, track their motion, uh, time average and ensemble of trajectories to cancel out Bra Brownian motion. And so this is a plot. This plot shows you the relative motion of these two squares, okay, at different orientations relative to the far field director. Um, and you can see at theta zero and theta 90, there's repulsion, okay? And then you get strong attraction along thetas minus 45 and plus 45. 
and then this sort of tangential component to the force at intermediate angles. Okay, and this, this actually agrees very well with what you expect for quadruples, which is interesting. And so, well, what about, oh, okay, I forget this. this my, my equations are gone. So, but the point is we can probe the distance dependence by, you know, so along 45, they track strongly. So we can release them, right, and track their motion. Okay, this motion, right, there's an attractive force and there's a Stokes drag. Okay, and so we can look at the interparticle separation versus time. And this, so this data is for three different initial separations of these two particles coming together. And, you know, like we can sort of analyze this in terms of a quadrupolar force which decays like one over r to the sixth. And so you can get different types of assemblies. I mean, one, one nice thing about these systems is, right, you get this really nice sort of um, registry between the two particles when they come together, okay? So you can form dimers, trimers, and this is sort of a symmetric three particle arrangement relative to the director. And it'd be interesting to explore whether or not, you know, more long range ordered, say, 2D crystals of these things would be possible. And so let me stop there. Um, and just let me thank funding agencies like ICAM, and you'll hear more about them later, probably, and the NSF and the Look at Crystal Materials Research Center in Boulder. Um, and that's, I'll stop there. Yeah. Come on, please. Okay. So. Okay. Here we sure. try uh, triangles with non-different sides. Oh, like a, a non-equilateral triangle. Yeah, non no, we haven't, but that's something we plan on exploring very soon. Sorry? I think there for for that uh, you 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 circle like interaction one hundred percent. Oh, great. Thanks. Okay, so, sorry, I can't talk for you. You, you were right saying that before, before it's done, you talk to you. you know, right. It doesn't matter what you see. This is my strong I think you're probably right. Yeah, you wouldn't see it for a while. But now it's the most important thing. Uh, today I'd like to talk.